Chapter 3 The Edward Conspiracy First Steps and New Beginnings Though the Boer War Though the Boer War had finally ended in victory, with South Africa's gold and diamonds in the hands of the secret elite, it came at a cost greater than the number of lives lost. Britain had few friends than ever before. Living in splendid isolation, devoid of binding treaties and with any other nation, had not been viewed as a handicap for as long as no other power on earth could challenge the primacy of British rule. British rule. However, by the beginning of the 20th century, one European nation alone was rapidly gaining a position which threatened that dominance. Britain retained its immense global financial power and still ruled the waves in terms of the size of its navy and merchant marine, but industrial leadership and preeminence was passing to Germany with the rapidity that caused undeniable concern. Following the Franco-Prussian following the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, the Kingdom of Prussia and surrounding principalities had merged to form Germany. When the bold Prussians defeated France, many in Britain, including half, including the half German queen, including the half German queen Victoria, and her German husband Albert, were delighted that the upstart French, the traditional enemy of England, had been put in their place. But the honest Teutons did not stop there. The rapid scientific and industrial expansion of their newly unified nation was the most important single development in the half century before the First World War. Unification had given Germany a new standing in continental Europe, and from 1890 there was no question that she was outstripping both Britain and France. First one British industry then another fell behind German output, capacity, or invention. Modern machinery, highly trained technical skills, application of scientific discoveries to production techniques, and a will to adapt to the purchaser's wishes were just some of the reasons why Germany forged ahead. Her extraction of coal quadrupled between 1871 in 1906. Production in pig iron quintupled and steel outposts and steel output rose from half a million tons in 1871 to 12 million in 1907. Germany itself, a former market for British products, had been transformed into a self-sufficient industrial nation. Then, having taken charge of the home market, its industries began to assert themselves abroad. Worried reports to the British Foreign Office confirmed that German iron and steel were being exported to areas of the world that Britain had long held as her own preserve, including Australia, South America, China, and even Britain itself. In 1871, the German fleet consisted of a few sailing vessels plying the Baltic, but by 1900, the situation had changed dramatically with over 4,000 ships carrying her merchandise across every ocean. In fact, the Hamburg American shipping line became the largest in the world. The Foreign Office viewed this competition and shipping much more seriously than rivalry and trade because it was a point of honor that Britannia ruled the waves. In addition, the mercantile navy had always served as a nursery for men of the fighting navy, and the rapid expansion in Germany and the rapid expansion in German German naval activity alarmed the secret elite. The German Chancellor Theobald von Bethmann Hogwell Hallweg referred to as Chancellor Bethmann from this point on in the text. 
stated that the British looked upon a Germany that kept on growing as an unwanted and troublesome intruder on the sanctity of British supremacy over the commerce and oceans of the world. The troublesome intruder had to be confronted. British industrialists knew but rarely acknowledged that there was also a marked superiority in new German manufacturers like organic chemical like organic chemicals and electric goods. The British press carried bitter stories of the unfair tactics of German salesmen spying on British trade practices, pandering to foreign countries and seducing them to the extent of heaven forbid, translating brochures into their own language. But the turn of the century by the turn of the century, German success was being denounced in exaggerated and overexcited terms. But the truth was even more evident. German industrial expansion had left important sections of the British economy behind. Having started its industrial revolution much earlier, British manufacturing suffered from comparative technological backwardness and the lack of new investment. A considerable portion of the profit from British industry was being invested in high interest yielding portfolios and securities abroad rather than reinvested in industrial modernization at home. The German Chancellor was correct in stating that the sanctity of British industrial supremacy was being challenged, but it was due as much to British complacency that, led, that leads were lost opportunities missed and markets overtaken as it was to German growth. Better quality, cheaper goods were now coming to, from America and Japan, but mostly from Germany. The secret elite did not accept that German economic and industrial success was just a reward for their investment in better education and new technology. Together with its burgeoning, with its burgeoning industry, and a brand new merchant fleet that promised future colonial expansion. Germany was also beginning to invest in oil production in Romania and Galatia. This was even more alarming because the secret elite knew just how strategically important oil was for future industrial development and warfare. The German threat had to be removed and war was the only means by which that could be achieved. As far as the secret elite was concerned, there was no need to be squeamish or reticent about war. Britain had never experienced a single year of peace since the start of Queen Victoria's reign in 1837, with British forces having fought in over a hundred wars of imperial conquests across the globe, the atrocities inflicted upon native Africans, Boers, women and children, the Chinese slaves in South Africa exemplified the gross inhumanity of British imperialism. While many across the world rallied and ranted as Sir Alfred Milner's and General Kitchener, the principal perpetrators of these atrocities, King Edward ennobled them. Civilized nations were appalled. In India, Burma, Afghanistan, Sudan, Egypt, Nigeria, Rhodesia, on small islands and great continents, hundreds of thousands had been slaughtered or left to die. Left to die of starvation in the wake of British imperial victories. What had Alfred Milner advised? Disregard the screamers. Ironically, those classroom maps of the world that proudly showed the extent of the British Empire and all of its glory used blood red to depict the conquest. If the secret elite were to achieve their great dream of world domination, the first step now had to be the removal of the Teutonic menace, the destruction of its economic prowess and restoration of the primacy of the British Empire. The plan presented great strategic difficulty. Friendless in her splendid isolation, Britain could never destroy Germany on her own. For a start, there was no continental foothold, and Britain's strength was her all-powerful navy, not a large army. 
diplomatic channels had to be opened and overtur and overtures made to old enemies, Russia and France. Friendship and alliance were required. This was no mean task since Anglo-French bitterness had been the main feature of the diplomatic scene over the previous decade and war between France and Britain over Egypt had seemed a real possibility in 1895. Russia was also an imperial rival with designs of her own in 1896. Both Britain and Russia had considered using their fleets to take control of the Black Sea Straits and Constantinople. Here too there was an unrealized war, this time between Britain and Russia. Historic antagonism are not easily forgotten, but the secret elite were not interested in building genuine friendships. The huge armies of France and Russia were integral to the mammoth task, task of stopping Germany in its tracks. Put simply, the secret elite needed others to undertake much of their bloody business, for war against Germany would certainly be bloody. Over the previous 30 years, Britain had stood aloof from the quagmire of alliance, alliances secret understandings and quasi-partnerships between the nation of Europe in breaking with tradition and drawing venom from its members of parliament who saw in alliances the immediate danger of being trapped into war, the secret elite encouraged the foreign secretary into a surprising move. In 1902, the conservative government announced the first ever alliance between any European power and an oriental country. Japan. It was a masterstroke. Britain and Japan entered into a formal alliance that they claimed stemmed from their joint interest in maintaining the status quo in China. Prime Minister Arthur, Arthur Balfour berated the liberal leader Campbell Bannerman for implying that there was some occult reason lying behind the transaction. Of course there was. Both Germany and Russia had designs on Chinese trade, and Russia had expanded its railway system into Asia in order to advance its influence there. The Foreign Office was, as ever, a day's march ahead of the enemy. Japan was the only country for whom the British shipyards had built an enormous tonnage of ships at the beginning of the century, including splendid battleships. At a stroke, the secret elite produced an ally who could block both Russian and German ambitions in the Far East. The Anglo-Japanese Treaty sat on the back burner of international relations, apparently inoffensive and unthreatening, but it put down a marker and broke the spell of isolation to which so many in Britain clung instinctively. It may appear a strange tactic to deliberately antagonize a country that Britain needed in the longer term as an ally, but Russia had to be broken in the east before she could be remolded in a manner that suited the secret elite. Unlike Britain, Germany was no newcomer to international alliances. In 1879, Chancellor Bismarck had opened negotiations that led to Germany's alliance with Australia, with Austria-Hungary. In 1887, he was also responsible for a secret agreement, the Reinsurance Treaty, between Germany and Russia. Bismarck was strategically astute. Potential enemies surrounding Germ surrounded Germany, and his system of alliance offered the newly unified country time and space to grow strong. Very full of himself, the young Kaiser Wilhelm II succeeded to the throne and dismissed Bismarck. He also chose to abandon the crucial alliance with Russia by deliberately allowing it to lapse without renewal. France, so completely beaten into submission by the Prussian by the Prussian German state in 1870, lost no time at all in recognizing in recognizing an opportunity to align herself align herself with Russia in a pact signed in December of 1893. It was on the face of it, a strange marriage of convenience. 
for the two countries were in many ways exact opposites. The French Republic could justifiably claim to be one of Europe's most democratic franchises, while Russia at the other end of the political spectrum was one of the last of the absolute monarchies. A Franco-Russian alliance, however, made understandably made understandable strategic and economic sense, since at the same time they had common foes in Germany and Britain. Thus France and Russia combined in a dual alliance, while Germany, Austria while Germany, Austria Hungary, Austria Hungary, and Italy had come together in the Triple Alliance. Before the Boer War, Britain had maintained friendly relations with Germany, but a sea change was taking place that demanded a complete rethink from the secret elite policy makers. Germany had to be knocked from its pedestal, its assumed ambitions curbed and the Kaiser humbled. After centuries of mutual animosity, France previously the most persistent and important British rival, no longer posed a threat to the empire. This change in attitude was reflected in the political storm that was deliberately generated after Kaiser Wilhelm's telegram of support to Kruger in 1896. While little regard was paid to the fact that French opinion had also been outspokenly hostile to Britain during the Boer War. During, this, during his visit to Europe, the French government welcomed President Kruger with ostentatiously with ostentatious cordiality. Although Kruger had specifically asked to meet the Kaiser on the same visit, his request was turned down because Wilhelm did not want to upset British sensitivities. This consideration cut little ice with the British press. Much was made on the Kaiser's telegram, but in truth, it was the German economic success story that struck in John Bull's crawl. The telegram was used as a weapon in the growing armory of British propaganda against Germany. France, on the other hand, was needed for the task ahead. Her criticism of Britain and cordial welcome of and cordial welcome for Britain's enemy were conveniently were conveniently overlooked. In addition to the new relationship that needed to be crafted with France and Russia, four prerequisites had to be met before Britain went to war with Germany. Each required dedicated and long-term planning. Matters could not be left to chance. Irrespective of any change of government at general elections, the secret elite had to pursue a consistent foreign policy focused on preparing for a war that would see Germany crushed and the problem removed. To this end, both major political parties in Britain had to be under their control. Whatever differences they might profess in domestic affairs, second, the army, so thoroughly embarrassed by the heavily outnumbered Boers, had to be reorganized into an effective and powerful fighting force. The third requirement was more straightforward. The Navy had to retain its supremacy on the high seas. That was a given fact of life anyway, but retaining supremacy meant modernization and further investment. Finally, minds had to be changed. Men did not march to war on a whim. A massive and consistent propaganda drive was needed to create a German menace and whip the British people into the froth of hatred towards Germany and Kaiser Wilhelm. Initially, German leaders were not overly concerned about the bitter anti-German rhetoric that followed the Boer War, nor were they impressed by Britain's overtures to France. They believed that a Westminster government would never sanction such an alliance. Germany's basic mistake lay in a deep-rooted conviction that Britain could never draw close to her traditional French enemy certainly not to her bitter Russian rival. Like everyone else, they held to the naive belief that parliamentary government was thriving in Britain. Unaware of the growing power and influence being exerted behind the scenes. While the Germans were slow to understand what was happening, 
others were not. Count de Lalling, de Lalling, the Belgian ambassador in London, clearly realized the dangers. On the 7th of February, 1905, he wrote to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Brussels, The hostility of the English public towards the German nation is founded apparently in jealousy and fear. Jealousy in view of Germany's economic and commercial schemes. Fear from the perception that the German fleet may perhaps one day become a competitor for naval supremacy. This state of mind is fomented by the English press, heedless of international complications. The spirit of jingoism runs its course unchecked among the people in England, and the newspapers are, bit by bit, poisoning public opinion. How right he was, but what did he not appreciate, but what did not, but what he did not appreciate was the extent to which this state of mind was being orchestrated. It was in meetings at select private clubs and weekend gatherings at stately homes like Tring and Metmore that the anti-German propaganda was agreed and policies determined. The secret elite deemed Germany to be the greatest single barrier to their global takeover. So they created a German boogeyman and invested in him all of their own vices. Newspapers, magazines, and novels spewed out their propaganda. Week after week, month after month, the sadly and sadly, the people of England swallowed it with relish. In a rapidly changing world where socialism, women's rights, trade unions, trade unionism, parliamentary reform, land reform, and a flurry of challenging demands were being presented to the government. The secret elite would require very strong political leadership and sustained support to see this through. Sustain, sustained support was the one thing that the secret elite could guarantee by ensuring that their trusted lieutenants and agents held key positions in government, the civil service, the army, the navy, and the diplomatic service, no matter which political party was in power. Alfred Milner was a consummate organizer, and his secret elite network stayed focused on their prime target, despite all the politi political distractions at home. Several weeks after the South African War ended in a victory soured by bitter acrimony, important changes took place in Britain. The conservative Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, resigned. In a blatant act of unashamed nepotism, he appointed his nephew, Arthur Balfour, as his successor, and therefore promoted another member of the secret elite to the highest political position in the empire. Balfour had been a member of the inner circle from the secret society's inception in February of 1891, and his family background and political instinct gave him every advantage in British politics and society. His mother was a member of the immensely rich and powerful Cecil family that had dominated British politics for centuries. His godfather was the Duke of Wellington. Balfour's early career followed the pattern of many of his peers who entered the political arena with no specific ambition, but with the ease and sense of entitlement that marked their upbringing. Balfour was ruling class through and through, but more he belonged to the most powerful and determined group of wealthy, influential, imperial loyalists whose secret agenda he could translate into policy and his new conservative government. The change of prime minister was no change at all. A much more significant change heralded the secret elite's most special weapon. Edward, prince of diplomats, king emperor, and inner core of co-conspirator. At 6.30 p.m. on January 22, 1901, 81-year-old Queen Victoria died at Osborne, Osborne's house on the Isle of Wight. Isles of Wight. Her death came as no surprise since her health had been deteriorating for some time. Nevertheless, it was a shock to the nation because Victoria had been queen for 63 years and the vast majority had known no other monarch. Poignantly, 
it was her favorite grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm, who cradled her in his arms as she died. Victoria had Victoria may have been mourned by grieving subjects, but the ascent of Edward the Seventh was crucially important to the secret elite. The British royal family of Saxe Coburg Gotha was rich in German blood. And while the grand old lady sat on the throne, war with Germany had been unthinkable. King Edward VII, however, detested Germany as much as his late mother had been fond of it. He and Kaiser Wilhelm met at regular intervals when racing their grand yachts at Cowes, but Uncle Edward had little time for his nephew. And this was in part due to the influence of King Edward's wife. Princess Alexandra of Denmark. She developed an almost paranoid hatred of Germany after Denmark lost the disputed territories of Skelwig Holstein to it in 1864. Although Edward, when Prince of Wales, frequently, frequently added as host to the Kaiser, he received very little assistance from his wife, who loathed all Germans in general and William in particular. She repeatedly wrote to her sister, the Tsarina of Russia, how untrustworthy he was, and frequently aired such opinions to her children. Edward's subsequent actions clearly indicated that he shared his wife's obsessive and venomous hatred of Germany. It would have been impossible to pursue war with Germany without the undivided support of the royal family. That they themselves were of German blood was no impediment. The monarchy was viewed as the font of Englishness. They sat at the epicenter of the greatest known empire. Edward was the monarch with whom the secret elite and their entourage fraternized or slept. Whether or not Edward VII hated his mother is a moot point, but he had cause to dislike her enormously. She disapproved of his lifestyle, his friends, and his lack of royal reserve, and she told him so. Victoria was not afraid of speaking her mind. He disappointed her, never lived up to her expectations, and she was convinced that he would not amount to much. She blamed him for Prince Albert's death and wrote to her eldest and favorite daughter, Victoria, who was briefly the German Empress. I never can or shall look at him without a shudder. Victoria tried to keep Edward at arm's length from government business, and he was frustrated that he was less trusted with official papers than secretaries and ministers. When Prime Minister Gladstone asked to include the Prince of Wales in the circulation of cabinet papers, Victoria would not have it, but commented despairingly that secrets should not be shared with one who talks too much. But as the Times later observed with stunning clarity, the invitation to Marlborough House and Sandrickham were by no means confined to the Butterfly Society. The future King Edward the Seventh was no butterfly. Edward's friends were not limited to the lush and the libidiousness the and the libidinous and the libidinous, nor was he the hapless inconsequent that his mother believed. He had considerable gifts, amongst which were fluency in French and German. He was an attentive listener and a first-class speaker who could deliver an impromptu speech that captured his audience and concisely caught the moment. Edward rarely, if ever, used notes, and he had the capacity to include others in conversation as he moved room to room. He was a charmed, personified, sharp, and incisive, and complete belied the lampoon characteristic, and completely belied the lampoon 
characterizations that belittled him. From 1886, Lord Rosebery forwarded, forwarded foreign office dispatches to him without the Queen's approval. And from that point on, every important foreign dispatch was placed at his disposal. And by 1892, cabinet reports and proceedings were submitted to him. He moved unseen by the public eye amongst politicians and nobility, government ministers and up-and-coming aspirants, diplomats, admirals, and field marshals, absorbing, considering, and discussing future policy. His closest friends included Lord, Lord Escher and Lord Nathaniel Rothschild. He took advice from Alfred Milner, was grateful to Lord Rosebery for the trust he showed in him as Prince of Wales, and he shared the secret elite philosophy for world dominance by the Anglo-Saxon race. After all, it was his empire they intended to promote across the globe. Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, who ascended the throne on January 22, 1901, took the regal title of King Edward VII. As king, he operated at the heart of the inner core in the secret elite. His greatest, contributions, his greatest contribution lay in engineering the much-needed realignments in international relations that unpicked potential rivalries, smoothed over past difficulties, and addressed the secret elite's prerequisites need to isolate Germany. Ultimate responsibility for foreign British for British foreign policy lay by precedent with the elected government and not the sovereign. But it was King Edward the Seventh who enticed both France and Russia into secret alliance with Britain within six short years. He was in effect the de facto foreign secretary. Many historians have denied his ambassadorial roles and his ambassadorial roles. His ambassadorial role, claiming that his foreign travels were visits of ceremony or of pleasure. What nonsense. Prime Minister Balfour's foreign policy proceeded exactly in line with the secret elite's grand design. Foreign Secretary Lansdowne facilitated the process, but it was King Edward who who emerged as the driving force. His work was crucial, and the royal stamp of approval assured positive public opinion, both at home and abroad. France and Russia were needed in a new capacity, as Britain's friends and allies France and Russia were needed in a new capacity as Britain's friends and allies. This was agreed in secret by the secret elite without the knowledge or consent of the cabinet. The alliance would have been unacceptable to most members of parliament and the general public, but were enacted for one single purpose, to throttle Germany. There was no real opposition to be voiced because the real opposition did not know it was happening. Befriending France was relatively straightforward. Though Napoleon III had admitted France was responsible for starting the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, many in France held a deep and bitter resentment towards Germany. The humiliation of the French forces in that war and the German army's siege of Paris still hurt badly 30 years on. In stark contrast, Bismarck's unification of Germany was hailed in Britain at at the time as desirable, even glorious, even a glorious accomplishment. It was, however, accompanied by the thorny issue of the annexation of Alsace Lorraine from France. Alsace Lorraine from France, which the French had always regarded as a crime. The brutal dismemberment, the brutal dismemberment of a nation.
It was, however, accompanied by the thorny issue of the annexation of Alice, Alice, Alice Lorraine from France, which the French had always regarded as a crime, which they called the brutal dismemberment, dismemberment of a nation. How the people of Alsace-Lorraine viewed it depended, depended on their own historic background. By the turn of the century, most of them spoke German as their first language. In Bismarck's defense, it was said that he had only been liberating territory that had earlier been wrestled had been wrested from Germany by Louis the fifteenth the fourteenth or the fifteenth when Germany was weak and divided against herself. In Bismarck's defense, it had been said that he had only been liberating territory that had been that had earlier been wrested from Germany by Louis the Fifteenth when Germany was weak and divided against herself. Whatever the rights or wrongs of Germany's annexation of the provinces, a small, staunchly republican military cadre in France wanted revenge. These raving cards were determined never to rest until the lost provinces were restored. It was this sense of loss, this strong nationalistic sentiment, which the secret elite in London encouraged and used to harness France for their ultimate war with Germany. For the Raven Chards, an understanding with Britain, a formal accord, was most welcome. They too needed allies. Political relationships between France and Britain had been low-key in the aftermath of French criticism of the Boer War. King Edward played a major role in smoothing things over and preparing the ground for an alliance. His ascension to the throne had fundamentally changed the rules of engagement. Here was a man who loved all things French, as Prince Regent, as Prince Regent, as Prince Regent, Edward had been one of the world's most well-traveled men but his favorite destination was always France. During the Franco-Prussian War, his sympathies rested with the French cause, and in the months immediately after, he toured the battlefields around Sedan and Metz. The fascination that France held for him from boyhood had fully developed into that of the rampant Francophile, and he became extremely popular in Paris. On private visits, and he was a frequent visitor, the Prince of Wales was welcomed in theatrical and art artistic society. It was suggested that by freeing himself of all official etiquette, he was able to explore Parisian life so thoroughly that he became as familiar to the public of Paris as to that of London. Queen Victoria was not amused. She wrote of her very weak and terribly frivolous eldest son to his sister, Victoria, in Germany. Oh, what will become of the poor country when I die? I foresee, if Bertie succeeds, nothing but misery, for he never reflects or listens for a moment, and he would spend his life in one world of amusements as he does now. It makes me very sad and angry. Victoria always referred to her willful son as Bertie, as he had been christened Albert Edward. Edward. In an effort to curtail his wayward lifestyle, the queen kept Bertie on the minimal royal stipend. But the Rothschilds and other members of his fawning entourage, like Sir Edward Castle, like Sir Edward Cassell, quietly funded his dubious habits. He certainly became familiar with some very interesting characters, but behind the image of the playboy prince that so worried his mother, Edward engaged with political and social circles that the secret elite sought to influence. Edward frequented France as some might frequent a brothel. 
incognito for personal pleasure and satisfaction. In point of fact, he visited the most luxurious brothel in Paris, Le Chabonnais, Le Chabonnais, Le Chabonnais, so often that his personal coat of arms hung above the bed, that his personal coat of arms hung above the bed in one of the most exclusive rooms. Heavily overweight, Bertie had a special love seat built so that he could enjoy sex with several of the girls at once. He loved Paris. The belle époque, époque naughtiness thrilled him. He was involved with many of the famous prostitutes of the period, and cartoons of the day struck the mighty likeness between him and the Toulouse Lautrec poster. Lautrec poster. France was always close to his heart, but not as close as his empire, not as close as the mighty aims of the secret elite. He was shielded from public awareness of his political machinations by the very playboy image he so readily embodied. It was hardly surprising that when the secret elite's charms offensive with France was at its height, King Edward was the spokesman. His appeal was personal and to the point. He, not the Foreign Secretary Lord Lansdowne, down, bought, brought the French on board. While Lansdowne dealt with the formal process of diplomatic exchange, Edward pressed the flesh. He was the secret elite's principal ambassador, bringing to fruition plans devised in the great country houses and clubs of England. Edward the Prince embraced the secret elite for their greater purpose. His, his, meager, his meager purse, his meager purse could never have addressed his gambling and whoring debts, his extravagant travels, parties and balls, or his horses and mistresses. He was accustomed to a lifestyle financed by others, by other interested parties who were either inside or close to the secret elite. Edward, the king, took his role at the center of the secret elites very ser seriously. And he was the instrument through whom honors were used to bind friendships with the royalty of Spain, Portugal, Russia, Italy, Sweden, Persia, and Japan, not excluding his relatives in Germany. Not excluding his relatives in Germany. In 1902 alone, Edward invested King Alfonso of Spain, Grand Duke Michael of Russia, Prince Emmanuel Filiberto, a cousin of King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy, the Crown Prince of Portugal, and the ill-fated Archduke Franz Ferdinand as Garter Knights. Those who believe that Edward was not involved in diplomatic intrigue and dismiss his traveling court as a circus showpiece entirely miss the point. Or perhaps they choose to miss the point. King Edward's visits to foreign parts were designed to cement relationships present British foreign policy as an act of benign friendship and unpick the alliances and commitments to Germany. The Germans were clearly concerned about Edward's activities, but had no inkling of a secret society spinning a web of intrigue across Europe. One by one, the nations courted by King Edward VII were brought into a shared sphere of interest. Sphere of interest. What made his input so effective was the public manner in which he assiduously courted friendships. Contemporaries assumed that Edward's royal visits couldn't have any political importance because as often as not, he traveled without a member of the cabinet or the diplomatic corps. But consider his input to the new era of British openness and the very necessary end of isolationism. 
he paid particular interest to the young King Alfonso of Spain, who in 1902, and at the age of 16, reached his majority and assumed his right to rule. On the eve of his birthday, Alfonso was invested with the Order of the Garter. King Edward's relationship with the young monarch was positively avuncular, avuncular to the extent that he acted as matchmaker by introducing Alfonso to his niece, Princess Victoria Eugenie. Eugenie. Lest the reader think that this is an example of Edward's consideration, think how valuable an alliance of royal families was with the country that had both Atlantic and Mediterranean coastlines. Within a few turbulent years, Britain was able to use that relationship to challenge Germany over control of Morocco. Edward VII's links with Italian royalty were similarly important. How better to undermine Germany's alliance with Italy than frequent personal visits and the applying of gifts of honor and status on significant per personages? A royal visit to Rome and Naples was arranged in 1903, during which King Edward was, during which King Edward the conspirator, conspirator had discussions both with King Victor Emmanuel, and the aging Pope Leo, the Thirteenth. His impromptu speeches proved to be disarmingly popular. Edward took, the, Edward took the opportunity to shower high honors on members of the Italian royal family with knighthoods aplenty for the diplomatic corps and admirals and captains in the Italian navy. In 1903 alone, Edward visited Rome, Lisbon, Paris, and Vienna. German journalists at the time and German historians afterwards connected these to the encirclement policy. The Germans saw Edward as a Machiavelli among kings, but English historians Grant and temporarily, and temporarily later dismissed his visits as ceremonial. How can they reconcile his obvious interference in international poli politics with the claim that his visits were merely for social and ceremonial reasons? Incredibly, some historians even go as far as to omit King Edward entirely from the history of the origins of the First World War. It was in France, though, that he first made his mark in 1903, displaying his gifts of tact and a capacity to reach out over political reserve and speak to a wider audience. Edward's public statements were aimed to appeal to the French sense of self-worth to herald a new beginning in international cooperation. He announced to the French media, the days of hostility between the two countries are, I am certain, happily at an end. I know of two, I know of no two countries whose prosperity is more interdependent. There may have been misunderstandings and causes of dissension in the past, but that is all happily over and forgotten. The friendship of the two countries is my constant preoccupation. The king was then treated to a banquet at the Elysee Palace, Elysee Palace, followed by horse racing at Longchamps. This pot-bellied, hat, top-hatted, cigar-smoking, brandy-bloated, flamboyant lover of life, of friends of their wives, was far more important in diplomatic and government circles than was ever acknowledged. So what if women of easy virtue were a constant distraction? Edward coped. In the summer of 1903, two months after the king's trip to Paris, the president of France, Emile Lobet, paid him a return visit, accompanied by the, raven the ravenous Theophile de Classe. De Casse, Del Casse, whom Edward had met and befriended on an earlier trip. An immensely important warmonger, 
Ducasse, Ducasse set to work with Foreign Secretary Lansdow on the terms of a joint agreement between the two countries. Old difficulties were put aside, concessions agreed, and a mutually accepted solution found to Britain's control of Egypt and France's influence in Morocco. Eight months later, on April 8th of 1904, the Entente Cordiale was signed. It marked the end of an era of conflict between English, England and France that had lasted nearly a thousand years. Isolation from the continent of Europe was formally abandoned. On the surface, the Entente brought the two countries closer without any commitment to a formal military alliance. The talk was of peace and prosperity, but secret clauses signed that same day were to have very different consequences. Some saw this as Edward's great autocratic design, as though he and only he wanted to formalize friendship with France, as if it had as if it was the king's personal gift to both nations. In this well vetted memoir in his well vetted memoirs, Sir Edward Grey, a long serving agent of the secret elite, reflected on this moment with lyrical approval. The great cause for satisfaction was that the exasperating friction with France was to end and that the menace of war with France had disappeared. The gloomy clouds were gone, the sky was clear, and the sun shone warmly. Put aside Gray's two-faced and self-serving image, the Entente Cordiale, the Entente Cordiale was indeed a diplomatic triumph. There is absolutely no doubt that King Edward was the man responsible for delivering it on behalf of the secret elite. But the sunshine was to be short-lived. The real purpose behind the intent was war with Germany. Why else were the secret clauses signed on April 8th of 1904 hidden from Parliament, from public knowledge, and from other governments? The Belgian ambassador to Berlin, Baron Greendell was driven to the logical conclusion that British foreign policy is directed by the king in person. His conclusion was perfectly reasonable, reasonable given the evidence he had before him. But Baron Gradle had many like him, but Baron Gradle and many like him knew nothing of the powers behind the throne with whom the king was a partner in conspiracy. The Belgian charged the affairs in London, Monsieur E. Cartier commented that the English are getting more and more into the habit of regarding international problems as being almost exclusively within the province of King Edward. What Monsieur Cartier failed to failed to appreciate was that the king was not an agent of the elected government. He was not answerable to Prime Minister Balfour or Foreign Secretary Lansdowne, but they had no concerns over the king's influence in foreign affairs. They too belonged, as did his majesty, as did his majesty, to an inner circle of the utmost secrecy from which all effective foreign policy stemmed. The secret elite. King Edward's association with the inner circle of the secret elite and his role in their plan for the destruction of Germany was strengthened by his first lieutenant, Reginald Balliol Brett, Lord Escher. He had been closely involved with Cecil Rhodes and Lord Rothschild in setting up the secret society in 1891 and was a member of the Society of the Elect with Lord Milner. Escher played a remarkable role for an unelected subject, an apparently independent mind, responsible to no politician. He turned down many top posts in government at home and in the empire because he wanted to work behind the scenes rather than in public view. His secret work was so important and influential that 
any public post would have meant a reduction in his power, he thus played a more important role than any cabinet minister, viceroy of India, or governor general of Canada. Escher's presence was welcomed in every arist aristocratic mansion, noble household, and stately home in Britain. His influence was a guarantor of royal approval. He vetted newspaper editors, sat on official bodies, committees, and investigations, and was rarely subject to public criticism. Though his sexual preference left him vulnerable to scandal scandalous exposure, Lord Escher's presence at the innermost courts, court of the secret society, at the war office, the foreign office, or the colonial office, at meetings so secret that cabinet ministers were excluded, wasn't unquestioned as his presence was as unquestioned as his presence in any of the royal households. When the South African War Commission was set up in 1902 to analyze the Army's near-disastrous performance in the Boer War, Estra was appointed as one of the only three commissioners. Why? He was not a soldier, had no relevant military background, and his experience as permanent secretary to His Majesty's Office of Works hardly qualified him to do more than oversee Windsor Castle. The king could not sit on a commission that the secret elite intended to use as a starting point for the complete reorganization of the armed forces, but his right-hand man could. Escher wrote daily to King Edward with details of the evidence, from every expert witness to the commission. He told the king that the defense of the realm was in such a perilous, perilous condition that it made it almost a crime to embark on any course of policy which might have involved the nation in a war. By any standard, this was a shocking admission and one which touched on the secret elite's innermost fears. It was clear that reorganization and modernization of the British armed forces was essential. It was a momentous task that required careful preparation and political commitment. So must had to be, so much had to be achieved before they could tackle Germany. Lord Escher's contributions proved invaluable. As a member of the War Commission, Escher interviewed all of the major politicians in both conservative and liberal, and liberal ranks, and as part of his role, assessed their views and commitment. These he discussed in private meetings with the king and his secret elite colleagues, so that when a change of government took place, they could influence key appointments and ensure that their chosen men took charge. The reshaping of the armed forces, for example, had to be led by a trusted man. It fell so Escher, it fell to Escher to ensure that the chosen incumbent incum, incumbent in the war office was such a trusted agent. He proceeded to influence the future development and organization of Britain's military policy and appointments for the remaining years of King Edward's reign. His position was entirely unconstitutional, but his role continued unchallenged, protected by his membership to the secret elite and by the king's patronage. One of the most important features of the secret elite's plan for war was to keep an iron grip on foreign policy. The long-term drive to war had to be imprinted on the departmental, departmental mindset of the war office the Admiralty, and in particular, the Foreign Office government, the, for, the Foreign Office. Governments might rise and fall, but the ultimate objective had to be, had to be sustained, no matter the politics of the day. To that end, the Permanent Committee of Imperial Defense, the CID, was established by Arthur Balfour, this secretive and very exclusive group first met in 1902 as an advisory committee committee to the Prime Minister. 
on matters of national defense, but was reformed permanently in 1904. In addition, in addition to Balfour, the only original permanent members of this exclusive committee was Lord Roberts, commander in chief of the armed forces and long-standing friend of Alfred Milfer, Alfred Milner. Escher recognized the strategic importance of the CID and the absolute necessity that its work remained hidden and at all times under the control of the secret elite, afraid that a change of government would result in a radical element within the Liberal Party gaining control of the CID, Esther pressed, Esther, Esther pressed the Prime Minister to appoint trusted agents like Milner, Field Marshal Lord Roberts, and Roberts' up-and-coming protege, Sir John French, as well as himself as permanent members. Balfour partly acceded he sanctioned the appointment of both Escher and Sir John French to limitless tenure of the CID. And at a stroke, the cabinet was literally eclipsed from discussion on questions of defense. Escher's appointment was again of the utmost significance. He ensured the, that King Edward VII was his successor. George the fifth received regular secret reports on all CID business. More importantly, he ensured that secret elite designs were followed, all hidden from view, and in terms of cabinet government, strictly unconstitutional. With dramatic simplicity, the secret elite turned Edwardian Britain from the rigid isolation of Victoria's reign to a country that embraced new friendships and alliance that suited their intentions in the 20th century. They clearly identified Germany as the enemy at the Empire's Gate and understood immediately that, on its own, Britain could not destroy her as a continental power. King Edward VII proved his worth as the preeminent ambassador by moving around the continent in apparent innocence, establishing personal connections with royal families, distributing honors with gay abandon, and canvassing on Britain's behalf to ensure, to ensure that Germany was surrounded by nations that enjoyed his patronage. Simultaneously, initial steps were taken to reorganize and restructure the armed forces to radically improve their readiness for war. In this task, the secret elite were disproportionate to his constitutional right. But what hold did an unwritten constitution have on a subversive cabal that operated in conjunction with the king, well hidden from public knowledge? Even at an early age, they understood they need to control foreign policy and the preparations for war, and to that purpose, ensure the permanent membership of their unelected representative, Lord Escher, to the Committee of Imperial Defense. Reconstruction was underway. Summary of Chapter 3, The Edward Conspiracy, First Steps and New Beginnings. The Secret Elite, the secret elite viewed German economic, industrial, and commercial success as a direct threat to their global ambitions and believed that war was the only means by which they could be stopped. Britain could not engage in a war against Germany on her own and needed allies to provide the military manpower. Four lessons had been learned from the Boer War. Foreign policy had to be sustained no matter which political party was in office. The British Army needed a complete overhaul to make it fit for purpose. The Royal Navy had to maintain all its historic advantages. The general public had to be turned against Germany. Britain's era of splendid isolation was brought to an end through an Anglo-Japanese treaty in 1902. The secret elite looked to Britain's old adversaries, France and Russia, as long-term potential, long potential allies, and King Edward VII emerged as their diplomatic champion. Edward was a natural Francophile whose playboy image served to screen 
his unconstitutional involvement in foreign affairs. Edward traveled all over Europe promoting the secret elite's plan, and he was the architect of the Entente Cordiale of 1904. Belgian diplomats accurately reported that the king's action as a de facto foreign secretary undermined Germany, but they did not know that he was acting on behalf of the secret elite. Lord Estra was appointed to the South African War Commission to analyze the reasons why the army had performed so poorly, and on the back of that and his close relationship with King Edward VII, he became integral to army reconstruction. Estra was also a member of the Secretive Committee of Imperial Defense, set up to advise the Prime Minister on matters of defense, including foreign policy. Eager to keep control of this exclusive committee, Estra had himself appointed as a permanent member, had himself appointed as a permanent member. Thus the secret elite dominated the reconstruction and realignment of the army and foreign policy from the start of the 20th century.